Well, good morning, everyone. May I welcome everyone to the fourth meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. And uh, may I start off by reminding everyone to turn off electrical devices so that they don't interfere with proceedings today. The first item on the agenda for committee members is to determine to take item four in private. Are we agreed that that should be taken in private? Yes. Thank you. Now, the second item is if the committee is happy to decide to delegate responsibility to myself as convener to pay any witness expenses arising from these roundtable sessions. Are, is everyone happy with that? Yes. Good. Thank you. So that will be dealt with by the usual procedure. I would now move on to our roundtable session and just explain this is a slightly perhaps less formal than an evidence-taking session. And we have the committee members and also various representatives from um, small and medium enterprise and organizations with us today. And individuals will, once we get going, raise their hand to speak and we'll seek to perhaps focus on our our guests today and what they have to say to committee members, although obviously committee members will come in with questions uh, as and when appropriate. Uh, for the benefit of our witnesses, there's no need to switch on your microphones. These are already on and broadcasting will deal with those issues. First of all, uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm Gordon Lindhurst, MSP convener of the committee. Uh, to my left, we have uh, the clerk ably assisting me uh, and others from the clerking team as well as the official reporters. If I might start then perhaps by doing a round of introductions and just asking everyone around the table to introduce who they, say who they are, what organization they're from and just a very brief uh, introduction as to what their organization or business does. And I'll start first of all and perhaps we can go uh, from my right around the table, I'll start first of all with Susan Love. Thank you. Uh, Susan Love, I'm Policy Manager for the Federation of Small Businesses and I won't say any more because you've just heard from me. Hey, my name's John Mason, I'm the MSP for Glasgow Shettleston, which is in the east end of uh, Glasgow. I'm the Vice Convener of the Committee. I'm John Lee, I'm Policy Officer with the Scottish Grocers Federation. We're the National Trade Association for the Independent Convenience Store Industry in Scotland. Um, there are roughly 5,600 convenience stores in Scotland, more per head of population um, than in the rest of the UK. The sector employs about 44,000 people directly, um, contributes about £543 million in gross value added to, to the Scottish economy, uh, and we feel it's a, a, an important part of the supply chain in, in Scotland. Jackie Bailey, constituency MSP for Dumbarton, um, and Scottish Labour's spokesperson on the economy, jobs and fair work. I'm Carolyn Curry. I'm here from Women's Enterprise Scotland for my colleague Anne Meikle, our policy officer, who was supposed to be here today, so I shall try to do my very best to replace her. Um, and Women's Enterprise Scotland, I think as many of you know, um, works to create an entrepreneurial environment where um, all women can start up in business um, with particular uh, aim to unlock the economic potential estimated at 7.6 billion um, GVA if women started up in business at the same rate as men in Scotland. Gordon MacDonald, MSP for Edinburgh Pentlands. Sandy Kennedy, a Chief Executive of Entrepreneurial Scotland. Um, Entrepreneurial Scotland starts with the premise that we have uh, been lagging significantly, not just for a few years, but for decades, um, on our economic performance. And it's a belief that um, we can become a, a truly entrepreneurial society is the, is the only way that we can resolve this and, and answer that. And by an entrepreneurial society, I'm meaning not just with entrepreneurs and startups, which are absolutely vital, but how we then look at how businesses are, are growing and scaling, how we look internationally, also how an entrepreneurial culture might also exist within government, within our uh, universities, uh, within the third sector as well. And the important thing to recognise is that it is already there. So this is not about one thing towards the other. 
um, how we do it is we have a network of many of the, the most famous or most successful uh, entrepreneurs coming through and that there are many people uh, who are coming in behind them and it's about joining the dots, working together collaboratively, but with a very high ambition. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Dean Lockhart. I'm a regional MSP for Mid-Scotland and Fife. I'm also the economy spokesperson for the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, and I'd like to thank all of our witnesses for coming along this morning. Uh, Gil Patterson, constituency member for Clydebank Mulgai, taking in a chunk of Bears Den. Better say that. And I'd like to declare an interest. I'm a member of SSB. I'm Colin Mason. Um, I'm Professor of Entrepreneurship at the Adam Smith Business School at the University of Glasgow. Um, I research on, on entrepreneurship on, on the Scottish economy, anything from home businesses to um, high growth firms to financing entrepreneurial businesses and also teach um, business startup classes. And my name's Andy Whiteman. I'm a MSP for Lothian Region. My name's Alison Grieve, Chief Executive of G Hold. We, um, we invent and manufacture handholds. Um, for different industries and our main focus is export where we sell to 20 countries worldwide both uh, products and licensing our patents. I'm Gillian Martin, I am the MSP for Aberdeenshire East. Morning everyone, I'm James Withers, I'm Chief Executive of Scotland Food and Drink, we're the industry leadership body for the food and drink sector. We've got around 360 businesses that will be members of ours, uh, the vast majority are food and drink manufacturers uh, and the vast majority majority are uh, SMEs as well. Um, we exist to grow the value of Scottish food and drink and, and ultimately uh, grow its reputation as well. Um, but we're a partnership body as well. So whilst we are industry led, uh, we're a partnership of the main trade associations operating food and drink alongside the public sector agencies all um, working to deliver a food and drink industry strategy. I'm Richard Leonard, uh, Labour MSP for Central Scotland. Hello, I'm Anne Johnson. I own a business called Blaze Manufacturing Solutions. I own it with my husband. We're a family business. We have 30 employees and we have a workforce of about 130 subcontractors. Uh, we've grown from our garden shed, quite literally, to premises that Howard and I own. We did 20 million the year before last. Last year we did 3.9. Our industry is in absolute crisis and we are desperate for help from the government. So I'm delighted to have this opportunity to speak here. <coughs> I'm Ash Denham. I'm a constituency member for Edinburgh Eastern. James Bream. I'm Research and Policy Director at Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce and also, in the other part of my life, direct developing young workforce in the North East. Good morning. I'm Liam Kerr. I am MSP for the North East region. Uh, I think I ought to de also declare an interest. I've set up and run various small businesses. Uh, including one that's currently in existence and is currently a member of the Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce. Right. Th thank you to everyone for that. Uh, perhaps I might start with a, a question I would like to ask on business rates, and large business supplement may not be so relevant to what we're discussing today, but looking at business rates in particular, changes in the recent past uh, what effect do business rates have? What would people here like to see the Scottish Government uh, doing about business rates? And perhaps I could start with um, asking Sandy Kennedy, who talked about Scotland lagging behind. I don't know if this is an issue that you're in a position to, to address, and then perhaps others of our guests would like to come in if they have comment on this particular point. I think but specifically around business rates itself. Yes, that, that particular aspect. I would say I'd probably there's somebody else who's better able to answer on business rates. Um, who, who would like to, uh, to take that question? Uh, perhaps uh, James Bream would like to come yeah, in on no, that. I'm happy if I go. Um, so obviously, uh, I think it was last week, a number of business organisations wrote um, about the large business supplement. So it's I suppose that element of it's well documented and, and the views on, on what should be done with that have are in the public domain. So I guess thinking about it from a small medium enterprise point of view, um, business rates, uh, they're an input tax, so you pay before you've earned a penny. So in that respect, for smaller businesses, I guess the cash flow impact can be more disproportionately harmful um, than for maybe larger corporates. Um, 
I think also for a lot of smaller businesses, as you go through the kind of cycle of investing in your business and property, that then impacts on your valuation. You invest and, and the valuation goes up. So you're actually um, maybe not incentivized as much as you might be to invest in property, which is you know generally unhelpful. Might actually delay investment in some cases around revaluation points. And I guess finally, you know, from a wider kind of economic development point of view, I'm not sure we're always doing everything we can to use business rates um, and positive movements around it um, in the way that maybe some other countries around the world do, looking at free trade zones and things. We used to call them enterprise zones, I think, in, in Scotland. That kind of thing might just be a good thing to revisit the past and see how they worked, because actually we might be able to, you know, when we look at the role of clusters and particularly incentivise greater activity around that type of uh, intervention than we, than we do at the moment. So I guess those are all things which look at what we could do if we change things. There's probably, if we did nothing with the current system, pieces around um, how the appeals process and works, you know, nudging, tweaking around the edges. But I think there's some more fundamental things that we could look to, to do with the, the system as it is. Do you, do you have specific countries in mind that we could take an example from or might be helpful to reassess our own approach to these matters? Um, I, th I think uh, th there's elements probably of different countries that you might look at, but if you look at um, the way that a lot of the, the Middle Eastern countries work around trying to attract clusters of, of business in the oil and gas sector as an example, um, there are a number of them uh, throughout the Middle East and Eastern Europe who have free trade zones. So basically they... they they're quite specific about what types of company they want to get into that area, and it really is about trying to build strong clusters. And actually, with, you know, with the reviews that are being undertaken by government, government at the moment, the th thing about clusters is that they actually have to be close together. That's the whole nature of a cluster, as well as being a sector. You can't look at geography and the sector in isolation. And so that seems to be an obvious um, tool that you could use. Um, at the moment... Do I see many local authorities thinking like that? Probably not, but it's maybe because, you know, um, if they were to take that risk, I think they would be fairly um, significantly financially hurt um, in the short term. So it's about using business rates as a growth tool rather than as a way to raise money. And I think that takes quite a, a long-term view on, on a business rates as a tool, um, which, you know, I'm, I'm not sure we have at the moment. James, Thank you. Can you say something about um, small business bonus and how that's been helpful to small businesses and supporting new businesses as well? Maybe the FSB are better placed, um, but uh, yeah, it's certainly something that's been he helpful. Um, it's been welcomed. Um, I wasn't with the chamber, you know, w when it was introduced, but it was certainly something that, as an input tax, reducing that burden is is really um, something that business finds extremely helpful in terms of that cash flow position. I think, again, when you look at um, how we use the, the, the uh, small business bonus scheme, looking at where the, the, the cliffs are and, and making mm -hmm. sure that we're, we're taking account of companies who are around those margins, that's probably, again, a bit of evolution rather than revolution, looking at how transitions impact when you jump up to the next level. Again, something that um, we hear feedback on that it might be useful. Um, again, that's a way to evolve the existing system rather than make a complete change. Was it Anne Johnson wanted to come in and then Dr. Lee also? Yeah, but from the small businesses, this is, I'm talking about shop owners, just one real example is the hardware store in Lawrence Kirk. What we're finding in the villages on the outskirts of Aberdeen is because of the downturn in oil, so many people have lost their jobs, no one's spending any money. The hardware store had, had expanded, and by expanded, I mean just put a bit of a makeshift roof on the back of the hardware store so they could sell gardening equipment, then found themselves with a, an enormous hike in the business rates, and that's the number one thing that's really stopping them from growing or actually existing just now. Dr. Lee? Gordon's point, yeah. The small business bonus is very, very, uh, very well welcome. Um, from our point of view, uh, the government has signalled its uh, commitment to maintaining it, which, which is great, but if there was some way that we could find of almost taking the politics out of it and ensuring that the small business bonus became a permanent form of, of, of rate relief without any strings attached, that would be 
that would be very, very helpful. I guess the problem with business rates is that they keep going up. Um, from our members' point of view, they are continually asking, what do we actually get for our business rates? More and more they have to pay for their own recycling, waste collection services and so on. As citizens, they are paying their council tax, but they also have to pay their, their, their business rates as well. And in return, they seem to be very, getting very, very little back back for them. We need more frequent revaluations. I think most business rates at the moment are based on um, a time a few years ago when the value of commercial property was, was much, much higher. So um, if we could look at some kind of freeze in the poundage, uh, small business modes becoming permanent and more frequent revaluations, I think those things would be, would be extremely helpful. And I think Susan Love wanted to come in and then John Mason. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I don't think it's any secret that there are a number of concerns about the, the non-domestic rate system. There are in all the countries in the UK about how the system uh, operates. Uh, and we obviously have an independent review in Scotland at the moment looking at that. From our perspective, I think there are short-term and long-term issues to think about here. I think there are some short-term changes that could be made to the system. So, for example, uh, I think one of the parameters of the review is about how we have a system that doesn't discourage investment. And at the moment, we do, uh, for example, for the precisely the reasons that, that Anne just outlined. So, for example, if you're a business and you're seeking to expand or invest in your property, you will not be able to find out what the rateable value is going to be of your property until after you have done the work because the system is completely opaque and difficult to navigate for small businesses. One solution in the short term might be that you delay any revaluation following improvement for up to two years for small businesses, which would give some certainty to, to make back uh, your investment before you pay higher business rates, for example. So there are a number of changes that can be made in the short term, particularly around um, the ease of use of the system from a small business perspective. But then there are many longer term issues that uh, are more difficult to consider about how this tax works and whether it's um, whether a property-based tax is the right one for the modern economy. There are obvious questions about uh, online business, for example, and how how that creates a burden that falls on businesses with premises. And these are all not difficult uh, to uh, not easy to solve in the short term, but are worthy of discussion. And I would say that uh, a property-based tax does place greater burdens on small, uh, smaller businesses for whom the rent and property costs are a higher proportion of their turnover than larger businesses, and particularly for start-up businesses who are trying to survive through early uh, overheads. And the Small Business Bonus Scheme has been a, 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 an absolute lifeline for them, particularly through the recession and now as the economy struggles to recover. John Mason. Yeah, well, I was just wondering, I mean, if there was to be less money coming into either local government or central government through business rates, would the preference be to, say, have more profits tax, so r raise corporation tax or income tax to compensate, or would the preference be to, say, cut services, spend less on road repairs, spend less on training young people so they'd be less ready for work? Does someone want to field that one? <laughs> um. feel as though the proportion of the total revenue that's being committed to government is being placed more upon the business um, than, than the general public. Um, that's that's a you know a perception that, that business has has. Um, would they be happy with a a, pro, um, a profit tax? I think this is exactly the point that Susan's alluding to. Um, there are always going to be winners and there are always going to be losers with whatever you do. Um, and I think we need to have a, a proper discussion on what is fit for purpose to help our economy grow rather than uh, kick a can down the road because it's a difficult one to fix. It may be that when we have that discussion, we find that a property-based tax is the best type of tax to help our economy grow. I don't think that... Uh, businesses feel that we've had that um, discussion and and so maybe there's a halfway house that half profit half profit I, I don't know but because we've not had that analysis and discussion yet but uh, I think that's where we need to get to um, because uh, you know and until we have that we're always going to return to this discussion forevermore and uh, I suspect probably some people who've been around for longer than I have probably had this discussion a few times. Right, Sandy Kennedy wanted to come in, and just to remind our guests, if you want to come in, please just indicate to me by raising your hand. Um, Sandy, 
just a very short observation, which is that a lot of the discussion centred around how we carve the pie up and who gets what and how it's allocated, and, and I think the point you make is a very good one. Um, I would ask the committee to always bear in mind how is it you grow the pie and how do you make that pie bigger. So therefore, if we want to see inclusive growth, if we want to see um, more investment into all the parts of the, of the communities we want to see, then that's only going to be possible if we grow the pie. And if we spend all our time talking about just moving the debt chairs around, then we'll be continually talking about it for 10 years' time. It's really important that we focus on growing the pie. Right. Um, I think Gil... Um, Patterson wanted to come in. Perhaps you have an idea about growing the pie or a further question. Yeah, well, I, I, just the point that James was making in, in relation to uh, the split between rates, how do, you, how do you cut it up? Do you go more on, on profit? One of the things is, and I'm now, now speaking as a business person, one of the things I like about rates, uh, I don't like the idea that I don't qualify for any business bonus because of the size of my business, but I've always voted uh, for it. I think it's good. And I think it saved a lot of businesses through the hard times, to be quite frank with you. But the one thing I do like about the business rates, it captures those who don't pay any taxes at all in this country. They tend to be big companies that don't that pay low wages. And if they've got, if they've got a footprint on, on the ground, they don't escape rates. And so that helps the fire service and all the other things that we get, like the roads, like if the, if, if the place is broken into, the police turn up to the places that folk don't pay tax. So that's one element. And I think we need to, we, we need to understand what's happening uh, in business at the present time, that we're easy, I'm dead easy to capture, I pay all my taxes and so do my employees. But some big uh, outfits uh, don't pay anything and I think we need to really consider that if you want to shift away from a rates form of property type tax. So if anyone would like to comment, that's maybe a, more an observation than and for comments. So could I add to that that, of course, internet-based internet companies may not fall within the category of those who would be captured by uh, business rates on property. Um, so that's a further dimension to add to what Gil has just said. Um, do we have someone who'd like to comment on this aspect of matters? One of our guests, well, Andy Whiteman perhaps, and then perhaps one of our guests might come in with some suggestions. Uh, yes, I was just going to come back on what Gil was saying. I mean, one of the biggest online retail operations is, is Amazon, and it pays more in non-domestic rates to Fife Council than it pays in corporation tax to the UK government, um, which is one reason why I echo Gil's comments that property-based taxes are quite good taxes because they're very, very hard to, 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 to avoid. Yes, that's that, that may be correct, but... I suppose for it depends if they have a geographic base within Scotland. Yes. That's, so there are some that wouldn't have that. Um, I'm just wondering if Colin Mason has anything he wants to add into this discussion on this point. Not on this point, but uh, I would share Sandy's view that I'm kind of disappointed at the way the discussion has, has gone. I, I think there are more fundamental strategic questions that uh, we should be considering. Uh, I think one of the most strategic questions is what are, what are Scotland's structural weaknesses in the area of, of entrepreneurship? Uh, one of them um, is, is we don't have sufficient companies that, that achieve scale. Um, this is not to denigrate small businesses that employ one, two, three, four people. They're very valuable socially and economically. But we know that the companies that achieve scale, uh, something called gazelles, um, are the ones that have a disproportionate impact. I, I was involved in a study a few years ago that Nesta published. It was a UK-wide study. It was called the Vital 6%, because what the study showed was that 6% of companies created more than 50% of the jobs. Now, the 6% and the 50% will kind of vary from time period to time period, but the gist is, is the same. Uh, we have a disproportionate number of companies who make a big economic impact, and Scotland disproportionately doesn't have um, these companies of scale. We've only got 3%. Now, I, I know that not every growing company will, will take a public listing. That's not necessarily a route, but it's a useful indicator. Only 3% of companies listed on AIM 
the stock market in London, designed for young, growing companies. Only 3% of AIM companies are Scottish-based. Um, why, why should that be? Um, I, there are other statistics, I won't bore you with that, but makes the point more generally that, that Scotland lacks um, high-growth companies. Moreover, the nature of the Scottish economy means that high-growth companies in Scotland create a lot of their jobs out with Scotland. Um, so, in a sense, we, we, we need to have lots of high-growth companies to create jobs um, domestically. One of the issues, I think, is a lot of our potential high-growth companies get acquired for good or bad. It's, 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 it's a... It's a complex um, issue. Having independent, locally owned, um, la um, solid middle-sized companies in Scotland is important, not least because the head office um, is in Scotland. So remember what I say, if a lot of high-growth Scottish companies are creating jobs in, in their, um, their export markets, very often their only footprint in Scotland is the head office, uh, or in many cases maybe only that's 50% of the jobs. It's important that decisions are, are made um, in Scotland. The head office also creates a demand for the professional services, the law firms, the advertising firms, the marketing firms, the county firms, and so on. So having he um, significantly sized locally owned, locally head officed firms in Scotland um, matters. I'm old enough to remember back in the, the 1990s when, when um, Crawford Beveridge came in as the new chief executive of, of Scottish Enterprise. He's a Scot, he'd been working in California uh, in a, in a high-tech company, he came to Scotland to take over the role of, of chief executive of Scottish Enterprise. His immediate observation was lack of entrepreneurship in Scotland. So he set up what was called the business birth rate strategy. At that time, Scotland was ahead of the game. Uh, it was a very well-researched, strategically thought out, well-researched strategy, which actually was curtailed far too quickly. Where's that strategic thinking happening? As I don't see it happening. I would I'd like to see some kind of... Um, think tank or some kind of, com um, some, some kind of um, working party set up to actually really nail these strategic issues uh, and propose some meaningful um, policy um, solutions. Thank you, Professor Mason. Um, Gillian Martin and Jackie Bailey wanted to come in. I don't know if one of you has a new point or on this point, perhaps we... Um, I Julian, was a it kind of a kind of new point, but it's yeah. kind of linked into what's been talked about as, as well. As right. Well, well, perhaps if you just want areas. to come in at that point, Julian. Um, I'm I'm coming here with feedback generally from a, a well-known company in my constituency, who was talking to me about the barrier that they want to grow, absolutely a huge demand for what they 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 supply, and they want to grow, but they're actually uh, saying to to me that the the barrier to growth in their area is. Uh, infrastructure investment in the area that they actually have their premises, which is Ellen. I'm giving lots of clues as to who they are. Um, and also uh, access to utilities. So the, this is a company that would like to stay in a rural area, which is great, providing jobs in a rural area, but be because maybe their demand for electricity, water, is such that it's actually sort of like outstripping what what's actually can be available. Um, and I just wanted to put that out there and see if there's any feedback from, from people around the table as to whether this is something that you've seen in, in your areas, which is something that needs to be, uh, be worked on in order to promote growth of existing uh, medium-sized businesses like that. Right. related, okay, because um, I, I confess to sharing a frustration at where we started off um, and, and absolutely agree with both Sandy Kennedy and Colin Mason about um, the big questions that, that affect us and it is about how we grow the economy um, against a backdrop of, you know, Brexit and all sorts of other things going on. Um, understanding what's going on in our economy, understanding where we should invest, what triggers there are that, and what levers there are that we can pull, I think is central to whether we're going to be successful or not in, in the future. So I absolutely endorse the comments about um, you know, making sure the strategy is right. I would add to that making sure that the institutional clutter is also right and there is a review going on at the moment that I would be interested in hearing people's views on. But I suppose in my head is, it, is it about investment in infrastructure, as Gillian's talked about? Is it education? Is it exporting, entrepreneurship and innovation? Is it all of them together? Um, and getting a feel from you 
as to whether it should be SMEs that are that engine room for growth, or whether it's the large corporates, um, you know, and where should the balance be struck? Because if you're looking at high growth companies, a lot of them will not necessarily be SMEs. Um, and is SE's Scottish Enterprises approach right um, to simply target high growth companies? Because they come in for a fair amount of praise and I think also criticism as well. Um, so is the institutional architecture the right to support that kind of high growth strategy. Um, and finally, you, the government's economic strategy is supposed to be that overarching framework. Um, not many people disagree with it. If you compare this government's economic strategy to previous government's economic strategies, they kind of hit the same buttons. But where are the, therefore, where are we going wrong? Is it just we're not implementing it? You know, is it the fact that there's no action plan or monitoring framework? What is it? Because we talk about these things constantly. In the 17 years I've been here, we've talked about the same subject several times. So what is it that's going to make the difference? I wonder if Colin Mason wanted to come back in at this point and then a couple of our other guests. Um, well, one thought would, would be that um, I, think, I think policies tend to... High, high growth firms come in all shapes and sizes, um, but I think there is there are some mythologies in within policy making about what high growth firms look like, and in particular that they're technology, uh, that they're, they're high tech, that they're, they're commercialised in the state of the art technology, which, which is which is not not the case, but it means that I um, think a lot of the um, schemes to support firms are based on this on these myths about what a, what a high growth firm. Um, we would look like. So I would think that uh, it's appropriate for policy to be agnostic about um, about what high growth firms look like. I mean, if you, if you think of the, the most recent, uh, or the, the kind of present generation most successful entrepreneurs in Scotland, there's the two Toms, Hunter and Farmer, uh, retailing and car repair, there's John Boyle and Travel. None of these guys would have qualified for public sector support because uh, they're, they're not deemed to be in sectors where there's growth potential. Look at Barhead, I'm just pick, pick one company at random, Barhead Travel. That's probably one of Scotland's most successful um, companies. Travel agency. But clearly they, they've, they've seen niches and, and opportunities, which is what entrepreneurship is about. It's seeing opportunities that other people haven't, haven't taken. Another, another problem with policy is to see this divide between manufacturing and services. If you go into, into the room and talk to business, that, that, that's nonsense. Um, some of the most successful companies uh, in, in the study I did for, 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 um, for, for um, Scottish Enterprise a few years ago, they call themselves solutions manufacturers. At the core, they have a manufacturing product, but they build around that various kinds of services. They say, if we were just a manufacturer, we'd be competing on price, we'd be out-competed by the Chinese, we'd be out of business before we know where we're at. But we're adding this intellectual value. So it's actually about business models. Uh, it's innovative business models that's the key to success, not, not necessarily the, the technology that um, people are, are working in. So that's one of my thoughts on, on this subject. And, and what can the Scottish Government or the Scottish Parliament do about these things? Going down to the detail, because, of course, the devil is always in the detail, and some of the issues that have been raised are perhaps matters of detail rather than high-level strategy. But the, the difficulty is putting that into something that can actually something can be done about. Well, um, I, I think S S Sandy's paper quoted the, this Sherry Cootie uh, report, a report by, the, by a Cambridge um, technology entrepreneur on, um, I think she pointed the, the need UK-wide for, for, for scaling up. I would like to see a kind of Scottish Cootie report, a, a report on, on the, the, the Scottish context, um, the, the scale of the problem, uh, and, and what we can do in, to create an infrastructure that um, not necessarily all by any means all provided by the public sector um, on how we can support um, entrepreneurs with the ambition to, to, to scale up um, and to avoid the kind of the, the, the problem of an anecdotes that you kind of inevitably kind of get in, 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 uh, in, in this kind of debate. So that, that's what I'd like to propose is a equivalent of a, of a, of a, of a kind of scaling up uh, uh, strategy, like the business, business birth rate strategy of, of 30 years ago. Uh, what do you think of that, Sandy Kennedy? 100% endorse that, <laughs> and no surprise there. I think for those people who don't know the Sherry Coutu report, what she does is she, she has five recommendations um, as to what she thinks are the big differences uh, that can be made. Uh, the first one, I suppose, sits out, outside of um, what can be done for the actual businesses, and that is greater transparency and collaboration across public, private, third sector, because we're all in this together. 
and therefore we need to collaborate and we need to pull together. So James and I were talking before that many of the things that his members face are the same things that Entrepreneurial Scotland members might be able to help with and vice versa. So I would urge greater collaboration by all of us. And we, you know, I, I see that clutter that you were talking about earlier about uh, Jackie is very much there. And it's not just in the um, sort of the agency side, it's, it's elsewhere. So that's the first point. But the second and the third, <coughs> the first, second and third relating to businesses were all about people. They were all about, do we have the right talent flows coming through? Do we have the right leadership capabilities, particularly when we're looking to export? And do we have the right connectivity? And connectivity is about people and connectivity, particularly into new markets. That is absolutely vital. So the point I would say, and I think, again, it comes to the point I was saying about growing the pie. The other thing that we've got to recognize is this is not something that just we've got um, your limitless amounts of money to throw at. We have a finite amount of money. If anything, we've got to accept the amount of money that the public sector can put towards this is going to go down rather than up. And therefore, we need to look at it and say, well, how can we do something truly different? And I would say the key lines of focus should be about how do we make sure that our talent that's coming through our best place to be able to go and grow businesses about growth, to make sure our leadership teams are the best leadership teams they can be with the right mindset, with the right networks, with the right connectivity, with the right executive education if that's required. And thirdly, we need to get greater connectivity into new markets as well. That is about the people side, and ultimately people is about culture. So therefore we've got to look at how is it, and this is I'm saying collectively, how do we collectively as a government, as a private sector, as a, as a community of the third sector, work together to change our culture, to become an entrepreneurial culture. And an entrepreneurial culture isn't just about businesses making profits, it's about how do we look at, how do we solve problems within the NHS? So for that reason, I've been working with, uh, with a number of your uh, civil servants within Scottish Government, but how do we bring these tribes together? How do we bring the Steve Dunlops of this world who are driving change in Scottish canals along together with the Mike Welshes of Black Circles or the Richard Dixons? And it's only by working together that we can make a difference. Thank you. And Carolyn Curry, do you share these views that have just been expressed? Pretty much. Um, I think I'd like to pick up on the point that, that Colin made. Um, what does high growth look like? Um, I think we do a lot of the right things. We look at sectors to understand where sectoral growth is coming from, but often um, actually high growth tends to surprise us in terms of its nature. It's very much um, a mix of the, the people. Sandy picked up on that, the personal traits that come through. Um, certainly, from our experience, um, we've just con consulted um, with uh, a number of women-led businesses, and there are some interesting trends coming through. We, we heard earlier this morning there's a, certainly an increase of, of women starting up in business, um, which is of interest to us, but also there's, there's a... a a change in the demographic coming through. There are more um, older age entrepreneurs coming into the market with um, the benefit of corporate experience behind them. So quite a different type of person coming in and um, with a lot of skills and talents at their disposal. And I think one of the key questions is how do we identify the mix of entrepreneurs that are coming through and pull those talents through to best advantage. Um, I think Sandy's point on leadership is really well made. I would certainly say that actually diversity within a leadership team is very, very important. So how do we actually harness the talents across the entire ecosystem to get real leadership and to make entrepreneurial Scotland a very exciting place to be that is open and inclusive to everyone? Because if you can bring everybody together successfully, um, I have no doubt that we could create a very, very entrepreneurial culture. It is that mix of different people from different backgrounds be, being able to come together to share what they know um, and to, to bounce off that that really can often take ideas and idea generation um, to the next level. Um, and I think we, we touch briefly on the the enterprise review. There, there is a structure here already in Scotland to help businesses and to help businesses um, get that support. I think what's really important is that we understand the end user experience and, and listen to those voices and see how we can make that support more tailored to current needs, but also to the needs that we are seeing coming through that pipeline and best shape that support to deliver. Thank you. I just want to bring in a couple of our business people here before returning to some of the members of the committee who would like to raise some points. Um, first of all, James Withers. Um, thank you, Kavina. I, I'm keen to, to probably echo some of the themes that have come out, and I think we're getting some really interesting 
areas now, and particularly the the issue that Colin Mason raised there about scale, because clearly we need to achieve scale if we want to internationalise, if we want to build our markets here and build them uh, overseas as well. But how we achieve that scale is going to be crucial, particularly in a country where we're dominated by SMEs. So in, in my sector, in food and drink, 90% uh, of our businesses employ less than 10 people. So we're not even at the S part of SME yet. We're really down at the micro end. And we can talk ourselves into that being a barrier um, to sector development. And I fundamentally disagree with that. I think it's absolutely a strength that we have. It is diversity, it is authenticity, and then a sector like ours where we're trying to build a national identity around provenance, about consumers' connection with individual brands, small can be beautiful. So how do we achieve scale whilst not losing that diversity of, of small businesses that are out there? And um, again, if I, if I just look at, at our particular sector, and eight, nine years ago, food and drink was static. It wasn't growing at all. Um, and now in 2016, we've got turnover up 43%. And really interestingly, the growth of manufacturing of food and drink in Scotland is growing at twice the rate of the UK average. And when you strip all of that out and, and think, well, why is that? What different is happening in Scotland? It comes down to collaboration. And to me, how we get small SMEs to work collaboratively uh, is the game changer. And that allows individual business to retain their identity, to retain the, their talent and entrepreneurialism, but achieve scale by working collectively. So um, to pick one subsector of ours, there are about double the number of independent craft breweries in Scotland in 2016 than there were six, seven years ago. The old school model is that to achieve scale, some of those bigger independent breweries need to merge or the big guys need to take over the small guys. That's a highly unexciting prospect to me. And I think for most customers that are out there that are interested in understanding the background to the brand that they're buying, that independence and that small, that craft, that artisan is important. But those brewers need to work collaboratively around logistics. They all need bottles and packaging and pallets. They're all interested in getting into the same markets in London as they are internationally. So to, to the question you asked a minute ago to one of those giving evidence, so what do we need to do? We need to think how we support collaboration. So there might be 200 food and drink businesses that are account managed by our uh, enterprise agencies. Most of them are at the bigger end. We need to think how we, through account management, through the support that the business bodies provide, how we support collaboration. So in a world of tight funding, how we deliver a one-to-many solution by bringing small businesses together and identify what those common issues are. And that starts creating mentoring networks. And a lot of the magic that comes out of bringing business together will come if we can facilitate that kind of uh, collaboration. Right. I, I think I saw, I'll, I'll come to um, Ann Johnson next, but I think, um, Alison Grieve, you were nodding your head in agreement, did I? Yeah, well, <clears throat> our products have spanned both food and drink and also technology, and I, I was really impressed by the collaborative work done by organisations like Taste of Aaron, who are different food producers, but who export together and have a, a collaborative brand, which I think has worked very well for that organisation. In technology, I find it quite difficult as a hardware company to be able to collaborate with software companies. I don't think that there are, I, I find that there, there are divisions within the business community of Scotland that really shouldn't and don't need to exist, um, especially if we're going to be competitive in international markets where a lot of these departments of R&D departments, hardware and software, emerged often. But I'd like to talk about growing the pie um, with a very small project, which is very focused, a bit like you talked about, looking through the large end of the telescope and looking in. Um, I've been working quite a lot with California State University and their teaching department, um, who promote mobile technology and education. And I have formulated with them an idea for a pilot project involving 12-year-olds because I believe a lot in education and in children sometimes showing us how it's done. So um, my project I would like to get off the ground is to collaborate with a group of five Scottish children and of about 12 years old and the same age in, in California to do a small import-export project involving Scotland food and drink companies uh, to export a healthy snack. So um, there's quite a lot of organisations that that might involve. And I think that although it's very small, 
It's to promote a culture of international entrepreneurship within the Scottish education system, and I hope that some adults could learn from it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Anne Johnson. I, I am on the High Growth Fund. I am a high growth company. I fall completely into your description, Colin, um, of what we do. We do fire protection offshore. You start off your company, until you turn over about £10 million a year, everybody leaves you alone. The minute you tip over that £10 million, the globals see you as a threat. And by the, the our, our competitors, Wood Group, Chubb, Tyco, those sort of companies, massive deep pockets, and suddenly you're a hindrance to them. You're up against them in bid situations, and they want you out of the market. Uh, the tactics are quite brutal. Um, the problem you get is by the time you've done 10 million, you're generally 10 years in and you're really tired. If you're a family business, you've lived it, breathed it, and you do live and breathe it every minute, second of the day with your kids. Your kids are fed up of you talking about it. They work in our business as well. And you start to think, someone's going to offer me loads of money. I don't blame anybody for selling out. Um, we've not sold out. We're still continuing down. What can the Scottish government do? Well, actually, you do an enormous amount already. Uh, we're part of Scottish Enterprise. They literally couldn't be better. They've been fantastic. We're parts of the Chamber. Elevator is marvellous if you're starting off your business. Um, I'm part of Scottedge. That's a great thing for the entrepreneurs to enter, and the prize money is £100,000. Marvellous. SDI, because we want to internationalise, fabulously supportive. But what could you extra could you do? The problem we've got is because we've been in a downturn, the operators are now saying they won't give work to us because we're too risky. So what could you do for that? You could maybe stimulate the market, actually. We're desperate for drilling to be in uh, the UK. So I'm not saying help me. I'm saying help higher up the economy and just leave us to it and we'll be OK because we'll, we'll work away at it. Um, also, maybe guaranteeing bonds for working abroad as well. That's a huge problem because banks don't want to know you because you're in a downturn. Uh, the other thing I wanted to address was Gillian's point about uh, working in a rural location. The only reason we managed to stay afloat was because of an MSP, Nigel Don, who stepped in and talked to BT on our behalf. Nobody else would listen, absolutely nobody. And it was actually an MSP. And I don't think, um, I don't think companies know how helpful an MSP can be. And I think it's up to us to make those relationships with our MSP so that we can filter through the message back to you so you know what's going on and also how you can help and how we can help you as well. Thank you. I think James Withers wanted to come in. No, I'm... Um, Sorry, beg your, beg your pardon. Um, James Bream. The kind of best one. Um, <laughs> just I think James uh, Withers already had come in on this. Sorry. No, it was just I didn't want the point that Gillian made uh, on infrastructure to be lost um, from the note. Um, kind of raised it about BT. Um, I mean, it's just unbelievable and completely unacceptable that that kind of example of a it might be a brewery, for example, is is being raised as an example that they want to grow, they're international, they've got huge scope for growth, and they can't grow because they can't get enough water. I mean, I'm sitting here thinking we've got a dozen of the most powerful people in Scotland here. How, how can that happen? You, you know, that needs to be um, put to the... Um, you know, Scotch Water, BT, these organisations, and just, just fixed, you know, that's just... It's just not right, um, and uh, it, it should be an easy one to fix, actually. Right, uh, thank you. I'd like to bring in some of the committee members now. Uh, first of all, Andy Whiteman, followed by um, Dean Lockhart, and then Gordon MacDonald. Andy Whiteman. Yes, my, my point was really, James has really addressed it, um, uh, or, or preempted it, really, which is to say that, um, following from Colin's points about growth, um, I mean, it's apparent in certain sectors, like, for example, distilling, brewing, uh, we had very large companies, most of these have gone now, um, or, or been taken over, and, and the growth is in the smaller uh, companies. And some of these companies don't actually want to grow to be Scottish and Newcastles, or Guinness, or whatever. I mean, they're perfectly happy. Um, the ones I've spoken to, to employ 10, 15 people, have extremely good order books, never be short of work, um, enjoy what they do, and not have all the attendant risks and uncertainties of um, wanting to double their turnover in 
five years or whatever. And so I'm just wondering if people have got comment about that in, in, in terms of how we talk about business growth. Perhaps, Susan, you'd like to come in there. Um, I think for us this is a, a, a <coughs> bit of a recurring theme uh, when we talk about, you know, fixing the Scottish economy, which I agree we have been, which we talk about aimlessly. Um, and I suppose, I suppose we feel very much that we have to remember that um, this is the economy we have, and if we want it to do more, we have to work with it, not against it, and work with what the people who are running the businesses want to do and what motivates them, what interventions are effective. Um, and one of the issues might be perhaps they see their value in delivering those wider social uh, or economic benefits in their place rather than seeing themselves as contributing to the bottom line of, of Scotland PLC. Perhaps they see that as a valuable end in itself, providing jobs and activity and income and a service for local people. And sometimes I think that can get overlooked. And so I suppose when we're thinking about um, the enterprise review, one of our questions is about what is the balance we want between Looking at the undeniable evidence that Colin's spoken about, about the small number of firms who make a disproportionate impact uh, on, on GDP and jobs versus reducing inequality and in some of the other outcomes that we want, which might be better served by different types of intervention. How do you reconcile those two? Because they might be very different things, and I don't really feel we've had an open and honest discussion about that. One of the things, to, to, two final points. One is that... In talking about how uh, we don't have the right type of businesses in Scotland and how they lack ambition, I'm not sure that's an effective way to talk to your audience to encourage them to grow by continually berating them for not being ambitious enough. And the second point is just about understanding that growth might mean different things to different people. I know it's a theme that comes up in women's enterprise, for example, where fast-paced economic growth might not be the outcome. Uh, that the business owner is looking for in the short term. So I don't think our language and how we think about this has really been bottomed out well. Thank you. And Dean Lockhart, you wanted to come in and then we can... Th thank you, convener. Uh, I'd like to look at a slightly separate point in relation to funding of the SME sector and, and business in general in Scotland. Um, the feedback we get is that after you go through the family and friend round of uh, finance and possibly, if you're lucky, the angel round of finance, things start to dry up if you're looking to scale up around the one to five million um, uh, range, if, that, if that's the type of mezzanine or other type of equity linked finance you, you're looking at. I'd like to get uh, the witnesses' views on this. Is, is, is there a funding gap? Um, and if there is, how can it be plugged? And related to that, um, how will the newly announced Scottish Growth Scheme, which aims at guaranteeing loans, not, not necessarily um, giving grants, but guaranteeing loans, how, how might that help in terms of both the availability of financing and the pricing of financing uh, given to SMEs? Would someone like to come in on that from our guests? I've fallen into that cat. I mean, we, we've, we've had the family and friends seed in the angel investment rounds, and it is, it's well known that it's a, difficult, it's a difficult period to get through that next period of growth. Um, and I do think that um, access to guaranteed loans would be helpful in that kind of environment. I do think it should be stated that the banks are better than they were five years ago, <laughs> certainly. Um, I do think that the Bank of England has taken measures to encourage that access to finance, especially after Brexit <coughs> was announced. I think that they have taken the right kind of measures. Um, but it will always be, I mean, it's, it, it's been difficult to raise that level of finance in Scotland for decades, probably. It's not, it's not, a, new, it's not a new environment. Um, and there are at least the, the programmes that have been available for seed rounds, the Scottish Co-Investment Bank and so on, have been massively helpful in, in helping to grow that community of businesses. 
So I think um, Colin Mason wanted to come in on that. Yes, yeah, so let, let, let's, let's talk up Scotland for a change. I think one of the strengths of the Scottish uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem is the number of angel groups that we have. We've got something like 20 um, angel groups uh, in Scotland, in, including Archangels, which actually is the oldest um, organised angel group in, in, in the world, even older than the, the, the well-known American ones. And they do tend to go, they, they, they take the kind of third, the third stair or the escalator, like the family and friends, um, solo angels, then angel groups. And with the, 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 the um, syndication that's possible through the, the, um, the co-investment fund and so on, you can cover up to two, three million uh, quite easily. And in many cases, with the falling cost of technology and so on, that is often, often enough runway for a company to, uh, to grow, to succeed to whatever point it, it wants to be. In some cases, we do need a five, 10, 15 million um, pound injection. I don't think we should necessarily look just within Scotland for that. Um, I've been doing some research looking at how small economies address the, the, the venture capital problem. I mean, we know that venture capital is geographically concentrated in, 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 in the major cities. I mean, in the UK context, London and the southeast gets about 60% of all venture capital that's invested. As Scotland, again, get, gets less than its 10% share. But in many countries, they're setting up what we call, call pipelines, connections into um, other other countries uh, to access um, venture capital. New Zealand has got a link into Taiwan with the, the, the Taiwanese venture capital organisation. We know that um, recently Skyscanner did, 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 did a funding round that brought in uh, one or two well-known American venture capital companies. So it's back to international connections. There's been a theme running through uh, some of the discussion before, which may well provide at least part of the answers to these large chunks of finance that, bear in mind, only a, only, a, only a very small proportion of companies are actually in the market to have. I mean, it's, it's, I don't know how many $5 million venture capital deals would be in Scotland in a year, very, very few. But I say they are the companies, the sky scanners of this world that make the, the, the big impact. Um, thing, I think Sandy Kennedy. To, to endorse what Colin said, I think the thing, um, having previously worked in the, in the venture capital, uh, for a venture capital firm, is it's, it's important to remember that the funding is really a, I don't know what the right word is, is a symptom of actually something else, which is that, well, what is that funding going to be used and what is it that motivates funders to put that money in the first place? And certainly I was, I was with 3i and the investment strategy is maybe a bit of a cliche now, but what they invested in was three things, management, management and management. And the bottom line is if you don't have really strong management and you don't have a vision and they've got very clear purpose for that funding, then we shouldn't be getting the funding coming in. And that doesn't mean there isn't a structural gap, and I 100% agree with Colin and, and what uh, Dean was saying as well. So, so I think that's really important to recognise that it still comes back to the leadership and the management that's in place in, the, in those businesses and what we can do to support those coming through. Thank you. And John Lee. Um, thanks, it was just really to say that the, the, the key issue facing our sector is very much what we might call the cumulative impact of, of costs. Um, a lot of these costs emanate from legislation, particularly from, from the UK government. The most obvious one is the, is the national living wage, um, which has a huge impact um, on our sector. Most staff in our sector, in the independent retail sector, about 80% of staff are in the 25 year, years old and, and, and age group and above, which is precisely the group that is, is impacted by the national living wage. Um, we'd already seen some evidence of a decline in employment in, in the independent retail sector which is the first decline since, since 2012. Um, also, the, a few years ago, the Department of Work and Pensions abolished something called the Percentage Threshold Scheme, which had allowed um, employers to claim back statutory sick pay. That's no longer available. Um, we've had the business rates um, keep increasing. Um, so altogether, um, the cumulative impact of, of these costs, at, at a time when we're seeing a, a period of um, deflation, price deflation in the grocery retail market, is having a significant impact on, on, on our sector. I don't always think that Scottish Government ministers, Scottish Government officials are, are fully aware of all the policy changes that emanate from Westminster. Uh, I'm thinking of the, the percentage threshold scheme I just mentioned, but also workplace pensions, auto-enrolment. I don't think they have a full 360-degree uh, picture of all the cost pressures that are impacting, that are impacting on our sector. Um, and I wonder if that would be an, a, an interesting area of work for the committee to make sure that officials and, and ministers have the full picture, the full cost barometer when it comes to, to looking at um, the, the cumulative impact of costs. It's becoming more and more difficult for our sector to provide the services that it does. 
Um, for example, our service, our, our sector provides very useful um, utility bill payment services. It's becoming much less cost effective to, to do that. There's a big issue here about financial inclusion, people paying their rent, people in the council tax. Um, so all, all of these issues are now impacting on our sector and we're beginning to see a drop off for the first time in, in, in retail employment. Thank you, Dr. Lee. And Anne Johnson, you would like to come in there as well. On the on the getting a loan, we've never asked for a loan. Um, uh, typically, a, a project is between three and twelve million pounds for one project, and we we uh, fund that by stage payments throughout the contract. Very careful with your terms and conditions uh, and your contract. But what we're finding is uh, the operators now want a guarantee. That you're not going to go out of business because obviously then you're too risky and that's why they're going to the globals they don't want to deal with ourselves i don't know if there's anything that you can do with the banks that we could get some kind of assurance from our bank i'm with the royal bank of scotland always been very supportive in the past that if should we need funding the funding will be there i suspect not because we've already been told by rbs that you know they offered us they offered me 100 million pounds two and a half years ago um and uh, now I don't know if they give me anything at all. I've not asked, but I suspect that would be a, a difficult question. It's in the speed of getting a loan as well. You know, if you were giving guarantees, fantastic. But it's got to be, if we're filling in a bid situation, we generally have four days. And I, and I think the, the wheels are quite slow to turn on guarantees and things. I don't think the committee can answer the question about the bank. <laughs> um, Gordon MacDonald. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of points. I, I was, it's really about the evidence that uh, we got from FSB. Um, one of the comments you make is 64% of businesses think that the current economic approach favours large multinational companies. Cause, so could you expand on that? And secondly, you said that every Scottish public body should aim to spend 10% of its procurement budget with firms with fewer than 10 employees by 2021. So can you tell us where we are at the moment? with that and you know how, how we should progress that to hit that target you were talking about. Sure okay um, so the first point relates to a feeling um, from a lot of our members so we, we asked them after the election what their priorities were and they expressed a feeling that micro businesses are not regarded as important in Scottish economic discussions and it's partly because of this conflict that I spoke about earlier because of the, the naturally and understandably important value that's placed on the small number of high growth firms can lead to the rest of the economy feeling undervalued. So it's about how you get this, this balance right. And so our point is about how do we both have, I think, I think it would be fair to say that to a certain extent that the focus of a lot of business support has been uh, focused on certain high growth sectors and firms. And if you are a business, despite having potential, if your face doesn't fit, as in if you don't hit the magic criteria for your turnover growth, then no one wants to know. And that's, that, may, that may be an unfair perception, but that is how a lot of small businesses have felt. So that's what that comment relates to. So is that a bit in relation to what James Withers was saying earlier on about um, the collaboration work? And therefore, should Scottish Enterprise be looking at supporting trade associations to build that collaboration rather or in, as well as focusing on high growth companies? So I suppose it's about um, what is it that we want our business mm. support structures to do? What are the outcomes that we're looking mm. for in the economy? And we would advocate that we need to do both. So as, as well as trying to focus on uh, f making a better job of finding the companies that need support who are going to make a disproportionate impact, also valuing the, um, the, the economic activity at the most basic level um, that's provided in many of our communities uh, by small businesses. If you're trying to reduce inequality and you have a community where there's next to no formal economic activity, it would be a good start to look at what small businesses can bring to that area. So we're just saying that we want a different value in terms of our approach. Collaboration's one way, and I think some of the industry leadership groups do a good job on that. It's not always going to be the right approach for small businesses. Um, the procurement remark in particular, um, in terms of spend with micro-businesses, um, because of the consolidation of procurement following procurement reform in Scotland over the last 10 years, um, there has been a reduction in the gen generally in the percentage of number of small businesses locally uh, who engage in public contracts. Now, you can debate whether that has whether that's good or not, because there are there are benefits that flow from that. But 
but there are fewer firms who are uh, getting public contracts. That has started to improve with some of the measures that have been put in place. Um, and we're hopeful that some of the measures in the Procurement Reform Act will, will uh, have a beneficial impact, but there are also threats flowing from that act as well. So at the moment, I think we're about 7% with micro-businesses. And I won't bore you with all the details of, of procurement, but there are various things that could be done around how public bodies implement their new procurement duties that could help us get towards that target. And the reason that's important is because of the flows of the money through local economies if you spend locally. Thank you. Caroline Curry, I think, did you want to come in on that point? Just to underscore some of the points that, that Susan was making. So, so your point about collaboration, we just um, undertook a survey for the, the Ministerial Enterprise Review. Um, we haven't released the results. Um, so in very general terms, um, definitely um, issues around collaboration. I think the handovers could, could be clearer. But also um, from a lot of the responses that we got through, the sense that at that point of support, their business isn't being really understood, valued, and therefore they're unable to access the support that they feel they need at the time that they need that support. So the two issues there, the accessing the support that they feel would be beneficial, but also the timing of which the current support is available and their frustration at that inability to access what they need. Um, linking that back to, to growth, um, very interestingly, the, the overwhelming majority wish to grow their business. So we've, we've talked earlier about the sort of constructs of um, what high growth might look like and, and how we might, might pull that out. And certainly from women-led businesses, what high growth looks like is quite different. That doesn't mean to say there is not an appetite to grow or that that different mindset around high growth cannot be grown and leveraged for the benefit of the economy. I think all we need to do is understand what that looks like and understand the support that we could actually put around that. I was really interested in Alison's comment about the, the small um, exporting pilot that, that you were going to undertake. And I think initiatives like that on a much broader scale would resonate with a lot of women-led businesses. So that sense of having grown something that is very important to them and their local community and the benefits that that has brought to that local community particularly, um, I think a lot would resonate with the, the rural community aspects that have been brought up, that importance of growing a business in a rural community. But actually, if that community has links to another community globally, then that internationalisation thought and ambition can be linked in. It's just about how you might go about linking that and making those connections. It's perhaps a little bit different to our, our current structure. Thank you. And James Bream. Yes, so uh, on the local procurement piece, um, and I, I do see and we hear about this kind of move to more looking at, you know, and it's understandable going for economies of scale, large tier one in, uh, companies, and then you tend to lose some of that local impact because labour and, and work will be bought, you know, along an existing supply chain around the UK or outside the, the UK. I think, you, you know, Therefore, the, the procurement process is still looking a little bit at financial um, value rather than true economic value. And the definition of economic value currently is a kind of set of quality criteria and a financial appraisal, and then you add that together for economic benefit. Whereas actually what they're not counting is economic value, so the number of jobs that might be retained by given a micro-business who's located in the area, um, some, of the t some of the work, and therefore you're actually counting the economic multiplier effect in the local economy. Now, I don't think you want to have an economic impact as part of every procurement process, but actually understanding that, and there is clauses in there about community benefit, I think beefing those up and using those is, is probably the tool that you, you, you could use, and it's in there already in some cases. And then on your trade organisation, but there is some, some stuff that happens with Scottish Enterprise particularly, um, we've run missions in partnership with them to Mexico and Colombia, taking companies overseas. Um, I guess one of the difficulties we face is that as a membership organisation who are self-funded, we would ask members to pay for our services, and the, the public sector is paid to do that, so members, uh, companies get that for free. 
in, in these occasions, we've agreed with Scottish Enterprise that any company that wants to internationalise can get some money towards that. And I think making that kind of thing more formal, so it doesn't matter who you're going to, whether it's Food and Drink Federation or Entrepreneurial Scotland or Chamber of Commerce, because you're actually trying to deliver the same outcome, how you enter the, the, the marketplace should be completely relevant. And so who delivers it, the public or the private sector? We need to, to kind of blur that boundary a bit um, because at the moment it, 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 is, it is quite fixed, actually, unless you can build a relationship. And if you're basing it on relationships, if a person leaves, it, it kind of tends to fall apart a little bit. Thank you. And I think Ash Denham wanted to come in with a question. I'm interested in uh, just taking people's temperature basically on the issue of Brexit, whether you think there's um, a potential impact that maybe you're already seeing now, whether you're seeing it, you know, you think you might see it more in the future. Um, so I suppose around if you're an exporter, <laughs> how important do you think being in the single market bear, um, you know, rather than having access to it might be of, you know, relevance to you? Or if you've got um, sort of concerns around maybe limits on free movement, whether that would affect you in terms of your employees. Sandy. I mean, just I think it's probably important to open it up to others. I think in terms of the, the attitude, it, it varies massively across the different sectors, different organisations and uh, different sort of leaders in different organisations, different sectors are seeing it very, very differently. So so I think it's important to see, see it across there. I think the thing that particularly my community, and I admit an utter uh, I'm biased in the selection, is they tend to be entrepreneurial uh, and therefore they see opportunity coming out of this as well and really have taken it and said, well, we have to de deal with it. I think I was surprised and, and we have you know gone to speak to them. The freedom of movement is coming out is much stronger for our communities and we've you know, we don't have a bias towards tech, but we, we cross over into tech, and they're very concerned about it. goes back to the Sherry Katu report that if talent is perhaps the single most important thing, if you're having your talent pool re restricted, and that's not just in terms of what does or doesn't happen, the uncertainty is, is very significant. Many of these businesses have, you know, 75% of their um, employees might not be uh, UK nationals, then I would say that was the big, the big thing that is universally concerning. But otherwise, they're just getting on with it. Anne Johnson? Um, from my point of view, we, we work in some of the shipyards in uh, Germany. Um, we need to be able to go and work there. So that's the free movement the other way. Uh, just a, a very small example, our local post office is, was going to close down. The only thing that's keeping it going is the Romanians that are working in the fruit industry locally. They send money transfers back every week and they get a, a fee for doing that. And the, the, the people from the post office said it's the only thing that's keeping them in business. I was astonished. So we have a lot of Romanians, Latvians, uh, a great mix of people who are very hard working within our, within our own area. Um, to stay in the to stay in Europe cannot be at the risk of having another referendum though. It it will kill just about every business that I know of because the oil operators have said publicly if another referendum is stated, they will delay their drilling plans. Already they're not going to drill in 2017 and heaven knows how we're all going to survive. But if they delay it any longer, we won't have an oil industry anymore because all the drillers will have gone bankrupt. And did I think did James Withers want to come in on this one? Yeah, I'm, I suspect there's an entire whole very long session on Brexit on its own, um, so I won't go into too much. But specifically to the to the question that, that Ash raised there, 30% um, of the workforce in food and drink comes from from Europe, and 80% of our food exports go to Europe. Um, so it's kind of the ball game uh, at the moment to, to a large degree, and we can't grow without that without that workforce. Um, I think engaging in ensuring that Scottish priorities are emphasised in a UK exit negotiating position are critical for, for SMEs in Scotland, um, and finding a mechanism to do that will be yeah as it will, be, will be central I think to, to our future. But there will absolutely be opportunities too. Uh, we know we, we rely far too much on Europe for our export business. Um, Whiskey is the one exception to that that have kind of conquered the globe. Uh, the rest of the food and drink sector is really quite. Uh, 
immature in, in exports, with the exception of probably salmon and seafood. So prioritising where those new FTAs are going to be overseas, and for us that's North America, Japan, China, top of the list, uh, are, is important too. So I think, I think there's a good level of discussion happening at UK level about what the post-Brexit plan looks like. Um, I'm not seeing that in Scotland, and I think having a more open discussion about what that uh, Brexit looks like for Scotland and where the priorities are, and in my sector, farming, fishing, food and drink, is a much, much higher priority for the Scottish economy than it is for the UK on average, so we need to be highlighting the differences uh, between the Scottish position and, and elsewhere. Thank you. And James Bream? Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at our statistics, and I think, you know, it flags up some of the stuff. It, it depends where you are and probably what type of business. In the North East, we've got more disposition to be concerned about the free free movement, I guess possibly a little bit more international, and we also have quite a lot of uh, Europeans in the in the fruit picking sector particularly, um, but also stuff about changes to regulation features very highly. Actually, with the rest of Scotland, from the Scro Scottish Chamber's point of view, they're looking at um, access to the single market freedom of, of without tariffs. So I, I guess that paints a picture of we're, we're different around Scotland, and it depends who you ask. But I suspect we probably all know what the issues are, and none of them look to, to be very easy to solve. Um, so uh, I'd wish you good luck with that. Um, the, advice, uh, the advice and support that companies are looking for it is actually a little bit about guidance, you know, as this starts to pan out, because I think people are frankly just getting on with stuff at the moment. Nothing's actually changed apart from things like currency impacts. Um, but that new market opportunities, um, I notice certainly North America being big in a Scottish sense, North East, you know, more Norway, UAE, um, slightly different markets, but maybe new ones for the rest of Scotland. So it's not without opportunities, but again, that's part of influencing where do we go first with through UK government as well and being part of that um, and understanding what's best, best for Scotland as we go through that. Um, yeah. Thank you. And um, I wanted to move on then to Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Uh, so I'm just uh, after a few comments, really. First of all, from Sandy and Carolyn, uh, you. I'm just interested in your opinion, following on from Alison Greaves' presentation, which I enjoyed in the papers very much. Uh, what do you think can or should be done at school level, at school curriculum level, in, as regards entrepreneurialism, financial education, that sort of thing? Uh, I'd also be interested in comments on a number of the papers talked about fair taxation and light touch regulation. Uh, and I'm just interested to know, at a practical level, what is meant by that, uh, particularly because James Withers mentioned earlier on about collaboration kick-starting craft ale. My understanding is that at least part of that was due to a significant tax break uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, so I'm interested to know how the tax system can be, can be used. Uh, and finally, perhaps Dr. Lee in particular, uh, now this is where I have my small business hat on, uh, I would have a concern about the Scottish Business Pledge uh, I'm concerned uh, with obviously auto enrolment coming in, uh, things like this, that actually things like the Scottish Business Pledge uh, could disincentivise growth. And I just wonder if there are any comments on that, particularly from Dr. Lee and anyone else. All right, who would like to start? Um, well, as an ex-banker, financial education, absolutely critical. Um, very, very important that, that that should be part of um, education nowadays, and um, particularly if you look at the growing numbers of self-employment, uh, gender apart, um, any other demographic apart, it is critically important for anyone starting up in business and enterprise to understand the financial side of things. Many people will, will come to enterprise with a great sense of skill, a great idea, a great drive. Um, often they, they do not come um, well equipped with the financial side of things. Um, and keeping yourself on the straight and narrow at startup is um, very, very important and a sense of how finance works is critical to that. Enterprise education, 
um, I think organisations like um, Young Enterprise Scotland do a great job um, in enterprise education schools and not just teaching it, but actually getting kids to, to live it, to breathe it. Um, Anne and I were talking earlier about her experiences. She might want to come in on this. But I think it is so important to make enterprise accessible to young people and to give those insights um, at a very early stage. Um, we are working on a programme at the minute, actually, with women, and the whole aim of the programme is to give them an insight into what business creation looks like, into what that process looks like, um, partly because they've had no education in school, um, and they find themselves in a situation where enterprise could be a really valuable option for them to generate an income, but they have no understanding or they feel they cannot access the support that they think they might need to do it. It feels like a massive step for them. And I can't tell you, we're at week four in the programme. We've got about 27 on the programme and virtually every single one is now talking about starting up in business. Now, that's from people who really were terrified on week one that they would never, ever have a business idea and that business was not for them. So that in itself, I think, is very, very interesting. There's a lot of learnings we're going to get out of this programme. It's a 10-week programme, so I'll keep you posted. Um, you mentioned the Scottish Business Pledge. Um, well, I am a huge fan of the, the Business Pledge. Um, I think it gives a real focus to the value of diversity and inclusion and, and to me, it's, it's a key document within the, the Scottish Government strategy. Um, I think we all have great intentions about meeting our end user needs, about being a diverse and inclusive nation. But unless we have a structure that holds us to account for that, it is very easy for it to fall off the agenda. Um, so I do understand there's potentially a level of cost and pain that needs to be debated. But certainly from, from my perspective, the value of that inclusion, but also the value of inclusion when it comes to innovation, um, internationalisation, some of the broader aspects that we've talked on today um, is huge and not to be underestimated. And that is where it starts. It starts at the heart of our business communities with the business pledge. Echoing a lot of the points that Caroline has said, um, I think that the more practical experience that, that can be brought into schools, the better. So what Young Enterprise Scotland does is, is spot on. I think, again, the point, the theme that you've heard a lot of today around collaboration is really important. So connectivity, how do you connect in businesses, um, or not businesses, we keep talking about this, you don't connect businesses to school, you can connect people to schools. So it's about how does Anne go into her school or we go into our school. And also role models aren't just people who are running businesses, it's also the people who are coming uh, through behind. Just as an example, um, we run the Salter Scholar Programme, uh, which is fit, averaging between 45 and 55% widening access, so we encourage all of those young people to go back into schools. Sometimes it's much, having been there personally, rather than hearing my posh voice in Springburn Academy, it's much more important that they hear one of their own talking about their ambitions and where they want to go. So I think appropriateness of role models is really key. I think things like Founders for Schools, which is about around connectivity, is absolutely spot on. I think, again, going back to the theme I mentioned earlier about you know, an entrepreneurial culture and, and mindset isn't just something that is embedded in the startup community. It's something where actually you see it in schools. Lo and behold, in the schools certainly I've had uh, the pleasure of being connected with where you've got an outstanding head teacher or an outstanding your senior leadership team in the school. Lo and behold, amazing things happen. When you don't, amazing things don't happen. So again, I would emphasise the importance of leadership uh, in there. In terms of uh, Caroline's points around uh, diversity, I think just a, really a, an additional observation would be that there is very strong research, um, I, the bit that I, I know uh, particularly is out of MIT, which looks at diversity in, in maybe a slightly different way, which is it's, it's not along gender or race or, or socio-demographics, but much more about that particularly in times of uncertainty, you need diversity of ideas, you need diversity of experience, you need diversity of expertise, um, you need diversity of perspective. And therefore, if we saw it more around how do we bring in that kind of diversity of ideas, then that will grow the pie, going back to the theme before. I, I do think that sometimes you do need to have rules and say that's how we force it. But as long as we don't lose focus on the whole point of it, it's because we need different perspectives to be able to grow. Like all of you.
things apply equally to universities. Um, I think we, we need to be creating entrepreneurial universities. And, we, and that's not in the conventional sense of how many spin-out companies do, do, do we have. It's how many, um, how many graduates set up their own businesses. MIT, we think about as being the most, perhaps the most entrepreneurial university in the world. It's not so much the, the, um, the, the staff starting businesses. It's their alumni um, starting businesses. So entrepreneurship needs to be embedded um, in universities, both in the architecture of universities, with entrepreneurs in residence, um, with hatcheries, with entrepreneurship um, s support people, but also at the curriculum level. It shouldn't just be taught in business schools. In fact, I know some Americans who said the worst place to teach entrepreneurship is in a business school. Indeed, when, when entrepreneurship kind of began in the States in the 70s, the first professors of entrepreneurship were in engineering faculties, and only latterly did it, did it move into, into business schools. So I would like to see uh, ways of teaching entrepreneurship across all disciplines. After all, many of the folk who are graduating in the professions, law, um, veterinary, dentists, many of them are in effect going to be running small and, and not so small businesses. So it's highly relevant to, 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 to um, many, many of them, accountancy as well. Uh, it's a question of how do you teach it? And um, to, to, to echo Carolyn's point, uh, I've come round to the view that it's experience. You have to teach entrepreneurship experientially. And I've done, like, like, like you've done, got students to actually start a mini business. And they, they say exactly what, what, what you said. Gosh, I never realised I could do this. Entrepreneurship not not a totally different way of doing things. I didn't realise I could do this. And again, in a country like Scotland where entrepreneurship levels are relatively low, a lot of kids don't come from... A, well, so let me put this another way around. The base way, the, the, the only predictor on who's likely to become an entrepreneur is if you come from an entrepreneurial family. I think you're twice as likely to become an entrepreneur if you come from an entrepreneurial family. So we're in a kind of vicious circle in Scotland because our entrepreneurship levels are quite low. One of the ways to break down that is, uh, is through, through education. If you're in an entrepreneurial family, you get your entrepreneurship education through the, over the dinner table uh, or on, on your school holidays. And I mean, wh why not have sandwich courses where rather than doing a placement in a business, you actually start your own business. I've, I've seen one or two examples of that. I think we can be quite imaginative in how we build an entrepreneurial experience um, into all sorts of degrees. Thank you. And uh, James Bremen, I think um, John Lee wanted to come in as well. Uh, uh, on the school stuff, I'll probably leave it, although it's really exciting. Just in the whole developing young workforce thing, I think we've started something here. Um, there's areas where we may need to force collaboration, if that's such a thing, um, particularly because in the educational structures there is an element of rigidity that, that we need to break down a little um, and we shouldn't hide that. On, on the risk, on the regulation bit, um, it's, it's really interesting different perspectives. I, th I think really um, we're in a world where governments are kind of pushing regulators to be a light touch regulation and risk based regulation and yet we're moving to a place where we, we put more regulation and tell businesses what to do and how to be good businesses and I think that I'm, I'm listening to the different perspectives and I think that we need to make sure that by introducing things like the business pledge we're, we're um, how, what, why are we doing it and it's back to that piece. Um, I'm not sure we can create diversity in businesses with a, um, a, a quota because it's about what the business is and how people think uh, and and I accept there are different views on that but my, my worry is that we're telling businesses how to be good businesses and so by saying you should pay this, you should have this type of person in, in your organisation um, and, and you must internationalise and all these things, well actually you, you kind of push some of the market out of, out of being a good business. And I suppose I'm an economist, so I'm naturally dispositioned to say that the market will sort all this stuff out. And I realise that doesn't always happen. So maybe I'm not an economist after all. So, uh, you know, that's just my, my nagging worry on this stuff, that actually we're, we're just pushing this stuff a bit too hard at the moment. And, and again, what you start to do is actually burden business because they start to worry about are we meeting this particular regulation rather than just being a good employer and doing the good stuff that, that businesses do? You know, yeah, it was, it was a good point that Mr. Kerr made about the, um, the business pledge. I think um, it's a very laudable thing. Um, one of its key elements was um, a living wage, which was essentially aspirational and, and voluntary. Um, I think any progress towards that was kind of torpedoed, I think, by George Osborne pulling the national living wage out, out of his hat without any real consultation with industry. I think even the low pay commission were taken surprised by it. 
George Osborne's two legacies to our sector have been the national living wage and the sugar tax. Thanks, George. So we, we think that what this is doing essentially is it is it stopped people moving towards that living wage, which was essentially aspirational and voluntary, and imposed on them a living wage which takes no account of the, the, the size of the business or the prof profitability of the business. Susan earlier outlined a very useful typology of businesses, micro-businesses, um, small businesses and medium businesses, rather than looking at them as a SMEs. The, the living wage takes into no account um, the size of the business. It's very difficult for a small business to absorb these um, constantly increasing staff costs. For a business now, staff costs are, are really not under your control. They're now under, really under the control of the, of, of, of the UK government. So I think um, a problem is that with the living, national living wages, that it's, it's torpedoed any move, I think, that a lot of businesses in our sector uh, were willing to wait, make towards um, the living wage that the Scottish Government has, has promoted. And I think the performance of the business pledge has been less than stellar. I think only about 250 companies have, have, have signed up to it. So I think the national living wage has been quite unhelpful um, in any move towards um, the, the kind of wider adoption of the business pledge by, by our sector. I'm just, I'm just wondering on the last point, are you saying that because there's a minimum wage has been set, that means that businesses will not move to a slightly higher minimum wage? Well, certainly in our sector, everyone now pays the, the living wage. I mean, from the retailer's point of view. Um, whereas before that came along, we were beginning to move towards some discussions with the, um, the Poverty Alliance and so on about how we could engage a little bit more with, with the business pledge and at least encourage some, some of our members um, to move towards the living wage that the Scottish Government was promoting. But now they all consider themselves to be living wage employers and I really have no, have very little um, inclination to, 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 to move beyond that. Susan Love. Um, okay, just a, a couple of points. First, in the pack that we handed out earlier is a report, School Ties, that we produced recently about the links between uh, local employers and schools, where there's a lot of work to be done. Um, fair taxation, light touch regulation, I guess fair taxation is in the eye of the taxpayer, I suppose. Um, and, um, you know, we could have a whole discussion about the types of tax, which business, how businesses might view fair tax. So, if you are a business in a high value low turnover business you may view the business rate system as, as unfair if you're a small business you may view it as unfair that you have to pay tax while global, global companies don't have to pay tax so a whole debate around what what we might mean by fair tax um, just in the business pledge i mean i suppose we've been fairly agnostic about this i suppose it's entirely fair for the government to set out its priorities in terms of the kind of good good behaviour that it's looking for from employers, because it's not a business pledge, it's an employer's pledge, um, which is fine. I suppose our question is about there's a risk that there's a risk in taking a tick box approach from the type of good rounded ethical behaviour that we're looking for from employers. Many, uh, as we mentioned earlier, many uh, small businesses exhibit great characteristics as employers, which their employees consistently rate as good, which they value, um, that kind of stuff doesn't get picked up by the business pledge. Um, I'd also question the extent to which it changes behaviour or does it just, is it just for those who were already doing all of the good things that we wanted to have a piece of paper saying they're doing it? And then lastly, picking up on James' point um, from an economy point of view, I think the real trigger for this is the market and what your customers expect and demand um, and I think in some areas and in some markets customers will drive a change in behaviour in terms of wage levels that they expect uh, businesses to be paying but there is a crunch point at which customers are not willing to pay more or will not value change in certain industries and until we tackle that we're, you know the business pledge isn't going to make a difference so we have to just recognise that the business pledge is going to be limited in terms of its effectiveness of changing uh, the problems which tend to be focused in particular sectors and type of business. Thank you. Richard Leonard has been waiting patiently for some time to get a question in, so perhaps Richard, you'd give us a question or two now. Well, um, a couple of observations first, if I may. First of all, on the taxation point, if you look over the period of the last 35 years, the shift in the burden of taxation has been from the rich onto the poor, has been from... Uh, um, uh, has been from uh, 
direct taxation to indirect taxation, which is much more regressive. So I think we need to look at it in the round, and I'm, I'm bound to say this is where God may stop nodding. You can't have 10 years of a council tax freeze and not expect charges to go up. Uh, <laughs> just, just for the record. <laughs> you can't. Um, my, my good... Tax in 1984 or something Aye. is now 20 percent. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, so I think we need to look. You know, we need to look at it in the round. And, and similarly in the round, I would say to uh, uh, Dr. John Lee that uh, the converse argument to the one you pose, of course, is that um, if you give people at the bottom end of the pay scale increases in their uh, disposable income, they're much more likely to spend it in the shops of your members than if you give um, uh, beneficial uh, increments to people at the top end of the scale. So um, I, I would ask you to, uh, to ponder on that. I, I just want to come back to a kind of an important uh, emergent point that's come out of the discussions this morning. And one is, it seems to me that on the one hand, uh, we've got an increased level of um, external ownership and indeed overseas ownership of what you might in old fashioned terms call the commanding heights of the Scottish economy on the one hand and on the other. Uh, you've got an increase in the number of people going into sole trader self-employment. And what seems to be missing, as I understand the way the discussion has gone, is that bit in the middle. And it's not a case of talking Scotland down. It's saying, compared to other countries, maybe we could do better in the development of the kind of medium-sized business. And that takes us back to what can the Scottish government do and is the economic development architecture the right one? And that's been reviewed, as, 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 as other people have pointed out. I suppose my immediate and present question is, um, with the devaluation, albeit involuntary, of sterling, and I recognise it doesn't affect some industries like the whisky industry uh, necessarily so much, but with the devaluation of sterling, that does potentially open up opportunities for an export drive. It does potentially open up the opportunities for import substitution. It does potentially open up the opportunities for tourism. And, I'm, and, and I guess my question to those in business is, uh, how nimble uh, is the support you get uh, in pursuing those opportunities? In other words, already are you having conversations about how we can drive our exports forward because the pound is devalued? Already are those in tourism having discussions about what can be done to better market Scotland as a destination? Is that happening or is, is there a lag in time between those events and the, where the apparatus of, of government is? Um, I can't, without commenting on those, in, those individual types of conversation, I would just make a comment about the infrastructure, the state infrastructure. And um, I mean, we've certainly commented to the Enterprise Review that it certainly doesn't have a good track record in terms of being nimble. Um, just in terms of how long it takes um, for programmes to be agreed to be rolled out across the different parts of the public sector that have to deliver it. Um, so we'd certainly, if you, if you use the recession as an example of a, a, a fairly quick change in economic circumstance and a need to reposition support, that, that wasn't a great example. And so we've certainly said this, this time around, given that this change can, can we design a system where we can drop programmes and change them or change the focus of them much more quickly because it hasn't been something we've been good at in the past? Um, John Lee. Um, I've reflected on Mr uh, <laughs> Leonard's point about uh, the national living wage. It's a very good point, but just, I, I, I say just very briefly, I suspect that the truth is that the... Um, the, the changes to tax credits and in-work benefits that were made at the same time as the Chancellor um, introduced the national living wage probably mean that people are not really that much better off. And so what, what he, he kind of gave with one hand, he just, he just took back with the other. I suspect that is the, 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 the truth of the, the matter. Curry. Uh, just on the point of internationalisation, are we currently nimble and adept? Probably not. Um, I would suggest from some of the responses we've seen. Could we be? Yes, we've got an infrastructure there to support businesses um, who are interested in exporting. I think what we've certainly um, picked up is the growing number of micro businesses that are actually interested in exporting but don't know the first thing about it. So I think there's a whole community, a whole business community there that are actually by definition very nimble, that could certainly be supported um, to export and I think there's a high value in looking at matching their needs into the service provision that's currently available but not just targeted towards them at the moment. So, huge missed opportunity. 
Thank you. Anne Johnson. SDI are a huge help in that. You're absolutely right. And it's um, and a very quick in the chamber. You've had the trade missions. Um, when a company decides to go international, the first thing they do is find out about the tax law. That's your first stop. And you don't want to pay your accountant because accountants cost a fortune. What I would like to see is some, some, a body or perhaps part of Scottish Enterprise that's able to advise because the cost of, of speaking to your accountant you would is just phenomenal. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's one of the considerations wherever you trade uh, abroad. Uh, we're trading in the Democratic Republic of Congo because basically there is no, there's no work here in the UK. The problem with that is they're just about to go into civil war. Who's going to help you? Nobody. So you have to be really careful with your contracts and your T's and C's. So working abroad is a risk. It's a higher risk than, than, than doing business here. But are we nimble enough? Yes, as a small company, as a big company, no, they're not. So that's where we beat them. Sandy Kennedy. Um, just really on the international um, exporting point as well and about the nimbleness. I think, again, you know, no, no surprise, collaboration, I think, has to be a key here. I, th I think part of the features, I know the agencies are trying to change this, this is a bit of a, of a walled garden around it. So therefore, SDI is seen as the only solution and sometimes UKTI might be a very powerful ally. I think when you look at um, our businesses and again our business leaders really we should be able to pull all the all the stops down at once so UKTI if they can help let's get access to we're paying for it so we should be using it SDI yep SDI do great stuff I tend to find that it's all down to the person if you've got a great in person in market then it makes all the difference if you haven't then you can go round and round and round circles Global Scott amazing asset probably underutilized uh, but opportunity to open that up and I think then if you think to the networks that say sit in the oil and gas sector, maybe some of them are useful to the food and drink sector. Maybe some of the, the people who we have within Entrepreneurial Scotland have connections that could be helpful to somebody else in another sector. The more that we see it, that we're all working on it together, the more likely we'll be able to do it. And the more we just say, it doesn't matter if it's UKTI, SD, whoever's doing it, if this helps Anne get a, a sale that she wouldn't have got otherwise, then we all put shoulders to the wheel. And that applies for everybody else. Thank you. Um, James Withers. That's right. Second, James. Um, yeah, I, I think on the international point, because you, you raise an important point there, uh, Ms. Lender, around the exchange rate at the moment, and, how, and are we nimble enough to react to that? Um, and the answer is, is, is perhaps not. But I think that the reason that international is important is not because clearly there's a short-term opportunity at the moment, but it's about balancing the, the economy and particularly balancing our risks. So, again, if I put whiskey to one side and you look at our, the mainstay of our sector, we've got too much business and too few hands in the UK. Um, so we're not balancing our risk. The reason why we want to export is because it's a transformational opportunity, but it's about balancing our market. So it's almost like, for those that are old enough to remember the old stereo systems with the graphic equaliser, bits will go up and down. If we've got lots of different options, then when things change, we dial one up or dial one down. But what we don't want to do is write a strategy on the basis of the fact that these change rates, you know, working well in our favour just now, because for every minute it's working in our favour on export, there will be a minute at some point down the line will it work where it won't be. But if we create that balance of good international markets, good UK market and good local market, then I think we have a long-term strategy that is robust to changes that we absolutely won't be able to control like, like exchange rates down the line. Thank you very much. I'm conscious we're coming to the end of our time here, so I'd like the two representatives from the two SMEs who have come today to the committee to perhaps um, give them an opportunity just to give brief comment before we close. Anne Johnson and then Alison Grieve. I feel like I've had an opinion on everything, but uh, and I apologise for that. It's just because having a having a business in a in a rural area you get involved in absolutely everything and we've had a very successful career uh, for the first 10 years this year is brutal absolutely brutal and i worry about how good a leader you feel you are and but actually these hard times make you a much better leader um obviously we intend to stay in the game and uh, recover but we're only going to recover from the help from people like the MSPs. We desperately need your support. Um, and we need support of all organisations. Sandy was absolutely right. We all need to band together. We're all in business. And it's been great to, to meet other uh, business leaders today. Because if I can help somebody in food and drink, you're absolutely right. I'll have had some experience that can maybe help yourself or help Alison. Um, I, I just thank you for the opportunity to come today. Thank you, Alison. 
Well, I'd like to just finish on a positive note, and it's actually kind of to your point about um, the opportunities that exist right now. Um, and you're right, I, I was astounded that there weren't more announcements about how we could capitalise on those opportunities in tourism and a step-by-step -step guide for some for, for people who perhaps would have a bedroom going for Airbnb during the Edinburgh Festival or, you know, a lot of uh, the general population don't realise the small steps they can take in the produce they buy in local shops, in, the, in their involvement to, with visitors who come to Scotland, in um, businesses who export or could potentially export overseas. So I think there's a lot more that we could talk about, about the amazing opportunities that exist and the fantastic support organisations that I do think exist in Scotland. Um, I suppose it's just more about promoting on, a, on, a, on an easier level rather than talking in big politics or big business, but for the everyday business person and everyday person in Scotland, how we can all help to, um, to reduce that trade deficit <laughs> and make us a more competitive country. Well, on that positive note, uh, we'll finish this session. And uh, I'll thank all of our guests. Thank you very much for coming to speak to the committee today. And I'll suspend the session so we can move into private session shortly. Thank you.